Well, good morning, everybody. Glad you're here today. If you're new with us, my name's Chuck, one of the pastors here. Thrilled you're with us today. For the past four weeks, we have been focusing really on one verse. Actually, it's only part of a verse, and it's from the book of James. And it says this, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So we spent the last several weeks studying passages about that. What does that mean? What does that mean to come near to God, that we draw near to him in our hearts with a, giving him our attention, our focus? We draw near him through Jesus and what Jesus has done for us on the cross, his sinless life as our representative, his death as our substitute, his resurrection as our guarantee and victory. It's through him that we can draw near to God. We don't have to be, have to do all these religious hoops and things, but we come to him through Jesus. We can come to him through faith, through repentance. We talked about last week, drawing near together as the church. And in this series, we've been doing this 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I wonder how that's been going for you. If you've been able to participate with us in that. But tonight it all culminates with a night of worship and prayer. In this room at six o'clock. And I want to ask you, if you're a part of our church, to make every effort to join us this evening. This could be the most important thing we do all year. We're gathering together to seek God's face. It's not going to be weird. We're going to sing some songs. We're going to spend some time praying through a passage of Scripture, praying for our hearts, our home, our church, and our city. We'll sing a few more songs. And then we'll be done. It'll be real simple. But what happens in here tonight as God's people gather to pray, the ripple effects we may not know till heaven. So this morning, we're going to finish in this season, in this mo moment, talking about drawing near. We will return to this theme. And you'll hear it kind of sprinkled throughout other things we do as we keep moving along, because we never get past this thing. If you have a Bible with me this morning, you'll turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, we'll start with verse 14. We're on page 844 in the Bible's under your chair. It'll also be on the screen. I'd like to pray one more time before we dive into the passage. So as you're turning there, let me pray for us. Our Father in heaven, we draw near to you now through Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. We open your word. We set our minds on you. And we ask you now to draw near to us, to speak to us, to encourage us, to challenge us, to comfort us, to heal us, to empower us to do what only your spirit can do. You are welcome and wanted. Help me to speak as I should. Help us to hear your voice. Strengthen our faith. Help us to believe and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Mark chapter 9 What's just happened in, as we, enter, as we go into this episode of the life of Jesus, he has just had what's called the transfiguration. And if you don't know, if you're new to the Bible, the transfiguration is a moment where Jesus goes up on a mountaintop with uh, three of his closest followers, uh, James, John, and Peter, and his appearance changes. He becomes dazzling. He becomes why his, his glory is beginning to show. And he's kind of taking on a, a heavenly appearance. And, and Moses and, I, and, and Elijah appear with them. And, and you know, Peter, James, and John are just like this. They're, they're kind of freaking out. And all these things happen up there. And so it's a pretty um, amazing episode, especially because a cloud descends. And there's this voice from heaven says, this is my son. Listen to him. So it's a pretty uh, important moment in the life of Jesus and studying his life because it just shows who he is. He's more than a teacher. He's more than a prophet. He's more than a healer. But he is God come in the flesh, the glory of God come down. So they're coming off the mountaintop experience. And that's when we join them in this story, starting in verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. 
And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about, arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. And before we move on, Jesus before this had given his disciples the authority to heal, cast out demons, and preach the good news of the kingdom. And now there's this moment where they can't seem to do that. In verse 19 might seem a little harsh because this father has come to him. And if you can imagine a father whose child is doing this, you can you know, imagine you're a parent and you'd be kind of freaking out. And then he seems to be harsh. But this exasperation isn't at the man, but at the unbelieving and quarrelsome crowd. And so when he says even, how long am I to bear with you? It's not like you might say, how long do you have to, have to keep this up? No, it's, I don't have much more time with you. Time is short. Because the event that happened before this is now the turning of the page, and now he's on a direct course to the cross even more than before. And it must have been pretty upsetting to see everything that happens in verse 20. The Spirit, and notice that it says, when the Spirit saw him, not the boy, but the Spirit. When he saw Jesus, immediately it convulsed the boy. And the boy fell on the ground, rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Let's pick it back up in verse 21. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. The disciples hadn't been able to do it, so this father's a little guarded. You know, if you can do something. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. All things are possible for those who believe. Now, this doesn't mean like, you know, people take this and like, well, so that means I can fly, I can defy gravity. No, it means to have, have a faith that sets no limits on the power of God. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. What a fascinating sentence. This kind, this kind. So there's kinds of spirits, Jesus. A little freaked out by that. And he says, cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Well, we can read the story again, but I think we might all have noticed that Jesus didn't pray. He just told the Spirit to leave. And you're like, well, that's Jesus. He can do that. But he's already given the disciples authority to do that. So does he mean that you need to stop and pray, fellas? Or does he mean something else? I don't think, and so I've studied it and looked at different scholars, I don't think he just means stop and pray for the boy. I think he's talking about like this kind, this deep-seated stronghold that's in this boy's life. You will have no effect on it unless you have developed spiritual authority from a life of prayer to deal with spiritual issues. Now that sounds kind of alien to us. In our little culture, neck of the woods, where we just like little happy truths, 
give us a couple of you know s- slogans with some Jesus dust, Jesus pixie dust on it, so it sounds biblical. But just tell me how to manage my time and my marriage, and you know, and, and raise my kids so they don't like become Satan worshipers. But I think Jesus has something more for us than just us managing life with a few Bible verses sprinkled on top of us. Because the issues we face today, they are deep-seated. The problems that we have in our world, and our culture, are huge. The rise of secularism, which basically its end goal is you can believe whatever you want, but you keep it to yourself. And if you don't believe what we want you to believe and say something opposite, you'll pay. Radical individualism. Be all about yourself. We actually talked about that last week. The decline of the church in the United States. The young abandoning faith. We're 60%. Some say 70. It's, it's, it's larger than 50%, depending on what study you look at. Of our high schoolers, when they graduate from high school, will abandon their faith in college. These are huge problems. To say nothing of our own personal issues. Maybe your marriage can't just, it never seems to really just be steady. Maybe there's something, you know, just going on. You can't seem to beat this anxiety. There's stuff going on. Maybe you have a wayward child or, or, or something. But here's the bottom line, I think, is that spiritual problems cannot be solved by human ingenuity. Spiritual problems need spiritual solutions, which means spiritual wisdom, spiritual power, and spiritual love. And that only comes from a life of prayer, a life of drawing near, that grows our spiritual muscles and authority so we can extend the kingdom to others. It's a life, a consistent rhythm of drawing near to God. Because this kind cannot come out except by prayer. This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. I think we face a whole world right now that's like that. And Jesus' word to us would be, you want to see change in the culture? It won't be because you voted your favorite person in the office. It will be because my people had decided to lean into prayer and begin to seek spiritual solutions for spiritual problems. Now, what does a life of drawing near in prayer look like? Real simple. It looks like two things. First thing it looks like, it looks like that you commune with God and you contend with God. Let's talk about commune. Communing is about enjoying our relationship with God. Jesus lived a life of communing with his Father. The gospel writers will talk about that he would withdraw regularly, continuously to to desolate places, lonely places to pray. He would just do that all the time. And if Jesus did that, then as his disciples and followers, then we should do that. Not just also because he modeled that for us, but because if you look at the scripture, it shows that we were made for intimacy with God. We were made to be with him to know him, to be loved by him, to be known by him, and to love him. We were made for what Thomas Akempis calls a familiar friendship. A familiar friendship with Jesus. And it's from spiritual intimacy, people learning to commune with God, drawing near to him in prayer. And you you might say, well, what about scripture? We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. So yes, scripture and prayer, drawing near to God personally, that from spiritual intimacy comes spiritual authority. It's in communing with God that we process our story with Jesus, our wounds with Jesus, our fears with Jesus. We submit our dreams to Jesus. We say, here is every piece of my heart. Because sometimes the more you commune with Jesus and enjoy relationship, the more you discover there are still pieces of your heart you might hold back from him. And with his loving kindness, he says, why don't you give me that piece? This piece? Yeah, why don't you give me that? And we just continue to give him every piece of our heart. Jesus called it abiding, remaining, 
continuously connecting in his love, in his heart, where he said in John 15 that I'm the vine and you're the branches. Draw life from me. Communing builds the heart to trust God, to relax in God. The word faith that's uh, all over our New Testament, uh, you know, we say a lot of times that it, it doesn't just mean, you know, like wishful thinking or, you know, I, I'm just going to wish it to believe it's true. I'm going to believe that if I step off this stage, I'll be like in that old Indiana Jones movie and a bridge will appear. You know, it's not just wishful thinking and hyping up some belief. But faith means to trust, to rely on. But if you really look at the word and look at the meaning, some New Testament scholars say there might be another word besides trust to describe what the New Testament writers talk about when they talk about faith. And that word would be relax. Faith is relaxing trust in Jesus. I don't know if you've ever done one of these things with your like, like a team or, or office or whatever, or whatever group you're at, but you always do these like, you know, these, you know, kind of group building exercises. And the worst one of all of them, in my opinion, is the trust fall. <laughs> and, I mean, it, it was just, I, I, I've been a part of them. You take youth groups to camps and it's like the camp people, they always like, we've got these exercises. And what if we did a trust fall? It's like, oh, it comes back to the trust fall. I've watched uh, someone like get like their, their mouth just bloodied in a trust fall because the kid that was supposed to have their arms like that flailed and just took them out. Yeah, that, that wasn't good. You know, I've done the trust fall and the whole time going, well, this is it. <laughs> this is how he went out. He was a nice guy, but he was a dumb guy, you know? <laughs> but what is the trust fall? You have to let go. You have to relax. What is faith? It is relaxing in the care of Jesus. And that's not laissez-faire attitude. It just means I'm letting go of control. How do you learn to do that? You commune. You commune with the living Jesus every day. Where you practice gratitude where you're thanking him for his grace and his kindness, and you grow. It's, it's well, I believe. <laughs> I'll relax in your care, but I'm still a little tense. Help me relax and trust in your care more, just like this guy prayed. Part of that comes through communing and being grateful. In communing, we lament, where we give and we tell God what is broken in our life and what's hurting us about the world. But this is what the believer should give themselves to. George Mueller was a, um, a, Christ, a Christian believer who started uh, several orphanages in England. Uh, he's written, uh, he wrote several books. You can find the autobiography of George Mueller. There's one book called, um, it's called something like The Answered Prayers of George Mueller. And he just has some incredible stories and things. I'm going to tell you a story about him in a minute. But this is one of my favorite quotes of him. And I, I read this quote often. The first great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day is to have my soul happy in the Lord. It's to commune with him so that my joy, my happiness, isn't going to be governed by the events of the day or the worries I have but I'm relaxing in his care as I walk through my day. I wonder what your life would be like if your first and primary business you attended to every day was to have your soul happy in the Lord, that you would read and you would pray and you would open the scripture and you possibly would just, I'm going to stay here until I sense his love and joy bubbling in my heart. I mean, what if for the next 30 days, you just said every morning I'm going to start seeking to get my soul happy in the Lord, to commune with Him. You prayed maybe a psalm. You read one to three psalms. Maybe you just prayed through the Lord's Prayer every day for the next 30 days. You can find in Matthew 6, the model prayer that Jesus gave us. It'll give you everything to pray, from worship 
to seeing God move, his kingdom come, to forgiveness, to giving him your needs, our daily bread, that, oh, there's trouble and sin, lead, it, lead us not to temptation, deliver us from evil, everything's there. But what if you just said, I want to be someone who communes with the Lord. That's why he saved you, to know him, to be in a relationship with him, to not just tip your hat at him and have little fortune cookie nuggets from the scripture, but to know him deeply. John Wesley wrote this about spending time with God. Oh, begin. Fix some part of your day for private exercises. Whether you like it or not, read and pray daily. It is your life. There is no other way else you will be a trifler all your days. I don't want to be a trifler. I don't want to go through my life and get to the eternal kingdom and realize I don't really know the one who I'm going to spend eternity with. I don't mean not saved. I mean, I, I just don't know him intimately. You know, the, the great part is when you haven't seen someone in a while, and when you see them, you, you know them, and you're just, your heart's just drawn to them, and you want to be with them. To commune so much with the Lord that heaven is just, well, of course, I'm with him forever. But you have to begin. You have to begin. Will you begin to commune with him? So a life of drawing near is about commune and it's about contend. Now, contending is about working with God to advance his kingdom. Contending is a kind of prayer where we are wrestling for the purposes of God when there's pushback. It, it, sometimes people would call it intercessory prayer, where you're praying for others because we want more for them than we can give them. Richard Foster says that intercessory prayer is a way of loving others. And contending is the idea that I don't just ask for little blessings, but I'm seeking to see God's kingdom advance in my heart, in my marriage, with my kids, in my home, with my extended family, in our church, in our city, and beyond. Because there will be pushback. I don't even know if you've noticed that there is resistance to the things of God in your life. Well, I'm going to read my Bible every day this year. How'd that go? Well, it went great, but then the next day the kid threw up or the next day my boss called and said, come in earlier. The next day, you know, like I, I woke up and I heard this weird sound and, you know, my, my, the, the sink was leaking and, and pipe was leaking. All that. It's, like, it's like stuff's going on. It's like there's a conspiracy to keep me from spending time with God. Because there is. Until you get dull and lulled into your normal everyday routine. You say, no, as a marriage, we're going to pray together. There will be pushback and resistance. You're going to keep yourself pure sexually. There will be pushback and resistance. We're going to seek to really try to point our kids to Jesus intentionally this year and read the scripture, or have a verse at dinner time, or, or, or you know, start our, our Sundays with worship music playing in the house. There will be resistance and pushback. The world resists you and says, Don't be an idiot. Your flesh resists you and says, ah, oh, do you really want to do this? There's so much easier things you could do. So much things that would give you immediate gratification. And the devil resists you because we're opposed. So we must learn to contend in prayer, to keep praying, not just to pray for something once, not just to pray for something twice, but to keep praying. We contend because we are opposed. The scripture reminds us in Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now that may seem like nonsense to you. But the scripture says this is how reality is. That people aren't your enemy. They may not be your friend. They may not be friendly. They, they, you may need to set some boundaries and all that kind of stuff. And we should still have, you know, law enforcement and all that. But the, the, the big enemy is the ruler, the authorities, the cosmic powers, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. 
How do you wrestle with that? You contend in prayer. You keep asking. You ask over and over. God, move in this area. God, grow this in my life. God, I'm not content. I've asked to be free of this, but I'm not going to let you rest. God, I've asked you to save him, but I ain't going to stop until he's saved. God, I've asked you to heal my marriage, and I'm not going to stop. God, I will, I, will, I will not be deterred from asking you. We are in covenant together. So fulfill your covenant promises to me by coming through. It's like that song we just sang, you won't fail me because your glory's on the line, not mine. Talk to him like that. That's how the biblical writers and the people in the story of Scripture from Abram on talk to him. Walter Wink wrote this, intercessory prayer is spiritual defiance of what is in the way of what God has promised. Intercession visualizes an alternative future to the one apparently faded by the moment, momentum of current forces. It visualizes an alternative future. Well, it looks like their marriage is heading to divorce. Intercession says, no. Jesus will restore them. Jesus will humble them. They will turn back to Christ. They will turn toward each other. It could be a long, hard road, but he will be with them. And their story can be different by the power of the Spirit. Prayer infuses the air of a time yet to be in the suffocating atmosphere of the present. History belongs to the intercessors who believe the future into being. My wife was telling me about how she was outside gardening one day and our neighbors have this little dog. And, and you know, it's one of those little dogs where you like you look at it and it like acts like it's, you know, Act like it's going to eat you, but if you do like a little move, it runs, you know, but it loves to yap. It's just a yapping dog, and it's just that annoying little yap. Now, if you have a yapping dog, you're like, oh, isn't it so cute? Well, bless your soul. Um, I, I know how to pray for you now, but, but this little yapping dog, when, when it's not your dog, you don't like it, you know, kind of thing. And, and so she's, you know, working, and it's just a yip, 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 and she's just like, Oof. Stop it, you know, and says that. And she's trying to like pray when she's gardening and all that kind of stuff. Because, um, you know, and it just, and finally she's just like, I'm trying to pray, Lord. I'm trying to spend time with you. I'm trying to be with you out here as I garden. And this yapping dog is bothering me. And finally comes to the point was, okay, every time that dog yaps, I'm going to pray that someone meets Jesus for the first time at Crossbridge. So let that dog yap. That's contending. You're yapping to God. You're not giving him rest. You're like, save them, save them. Did you hear me say save them? By the way, could you save them? I will yap until he says, until, until it's like, no, I'm done. The Spirit says move on or best of all, yes. And so I, you contend for your heart, help my unbelief. Help me be more like Jesus. You contend for all the things you're praying for. Commune and contend. This is the life of drawing near. And we need two things to keep this up, to commune and contend. Two things. So to live drawing near, first, we need to be persistent. We need to be persistent. Jesus tells a parable in Luke chapter 18 and he tells them this parable, it says in verse 1, so they ought always, his disciples always ought, they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Disciples of Jesus ought always to pray and not lose heart. And we can lose heart. We can lose heart in communing with God because this may be, some people say, the most difficult time in all of human history to pray. We have distractions where our, our prayers are triggered with guilt and worry and boredom. This may be one of the most difficult times in human history for, for a Christian to pray. We can lose heart because we don't feel like anything's happening. We feel like we're praying and things are getting worse. But we have to be persistent. We have to persevere. I was telling you about George Mueller a moment ago. George Mueller became a Christian at age 30. And he lived until he was 93. Now, apparently, there are over 50,000 recorded specific answers to prayer that George Mueller has written, prayers he's prayed. 
when he opened his orphanage, he decided, I will tell no one my needs. Here is his fundraising strategy. We have a need, I ask God for it. You know, and, and I'm not saying everyone else should do that. You know, it's not how I started Crossbridge, if, you know, and all that. That was his call. And, I mean, he, you know, but then again, he has a, he has a book of 50,000 specific answers to prayer. I, I don't. When he became a Christian, he began to pray immediately for his five best friends to meet Jesus. These are the friends he partied with and hung out with and, you know, just did life with. So his, the first friend came to know Jesus 18 months later. 18 months, a year and six months. I mean, when you hear it, it's like, that's not very long. If you have a pressing problem right now that's crushing your soul, and you're like, I need relief today, now you got to wait 18 months. It can seem like an eternity, because a lot can happen in 18 months. His first friend came to know Jesus 18 months later. George Mueller kept praying. His second friend came to know Jesus Five years later. Five years. You ever prayed for anything for five years? Or you just had to persevere? You didn't lose heart? His third friend came to know Jesus 11 years later. 11 years. And Mueller, it records, he prayed for his friends every day that they would meet Jesus. You would think after a couple of, I mean, I don't even want to know when I would lose heart. I don't know if I'd last five or 11 years. His fourth friend came to know Jesus 52 years later. 52 years of asking Jesus every day, let, save my friend, open their eyes, remove the blinders, change their heart, draw them to your kingdom. 52 years. When George Mueller was on his deathbed, the people that were there caring for him, they would see his mouth moving and they would lean down to hear him praying. And on his deathbed, near his last breath, Mueller was praying for the fifth friend. So he dies. And on the day of his funeral, the fifth friend is there and one of the people that was caring for Mueller on his deathbed told the fifth friend, do you know what George was doing as he was dying? He was praying that you would meet Jesus as your Savior. And that man at George Mueller surrendered his life to Jesus. Remember, he was saved at 30 he died at 93, 63 years later. That's the kind of persistence we need. We've got to play the long game in prayer. We can't just show up to pray tomorrow and I didn't feel anything, not feeling it, so I give it up. We've got to persevere. We've got to come back the next day. We've got to commune and contend. I'm not seeing change. Don't lose heart. We have to always to pray and not lose heart. It is God's desire to see individuals and families come to faith in Jesus. It is God's desire to see people delivered from addictions. It is God's desire to deliver people from racism, sexism, nationalism, consumerism, and I could spend the rest of the day filling in the isms. It is God's desire to bring awakening to cities. And it is through God's people persistently communing with him and, and growing in God's heart and contending for the things of God that will see God break through. Prayer is the key, friends. Drawing near is the key because this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. We need to be persistent and we need desperation. Because there's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere else to go. I'm convinced the most reason, reason I don't pray is because I'm not desperate enough. I still think I can solve some problems. I still think I'll have the right idea. But desperation is when you come to that place where I have no other hope but Jesus. 
Desperation is where you realize, parents, you can't make your kids believe. I know when they're six and they're singing the songs and they love to read the Jesus Storybook Bible, that's great. But when they start develop, trying to wrestle with questions on their own and you realize you're not going to be able to talk them into faith, love them into faith, the only thing you have left is you have to pray them into faith. Amen. And you got to realize what the next generation needs is a move of God, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And if I may just comment on the state of the next generation for a moment. After being a youth pastor for 10 years, I've told this to Jacob, our youth pastor, this may be the hardest time to be a youth pastor. And we may have to, we have to come, the church has to come to, you know, we, we, people get scared. Well, I don't deal with teenagers and all that kind of stuff. Stop being scared of them. They're not going to bite you. and You're not going to get infected. I mean, maybe one of them will bite you. I don't know. <laughs> Every now and then there's a biter, you know, whatever. But we have to come to the place where we realize that free pizza and silly nonsense and trying to be super cool is not going to turn the tide. Amen. You bringing your kid to church in a couple of hours a week is not going to face, is not going to beat TikTok and YouTube. Amen. If you think it is, you're toast. What will turn the tide? History belongs to the intercessors. This kind only comes out, can only be driven out through prayer. We need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We have to be desperate for our kids, for our marriage, for our cities. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we were at my son's basketball game, and it's packed. It's the first uh, varsity home game of the season. You got the cheerleaders there. So you got the parents of both teams. You got kids there to see the first game, the first, you know, cheering on their friends. You got the cheerleaders there. You got all the parents and grandparents of the cheerleaders there to watch them and, and all that. It's just packed. It's loud. It's roaring. And so it's going. You know, every shot that our team makes, which wasn't many, uh, they're screaming and cheering and all, and all that. And, and all, you know, things are going on. And it's just just loud and it's just you know energetic and all of that we're not even done with the first quarter and the the refs start blowing the whistles like madmen to get the game to stop and I look over and notice on the visiting team's bench that and behind the where, where it's played there's a stage you'd be like them sitting in front of this stage you see one of the players is bent over lying on the stage his feet are sticking straight out stiff as a board and he seems to be shaking like he's having some kind of seizure They check his pulse. He has none. His heart is stopped. 911 is called. CPR is administer administrated. The roar of the room was silenced in a moment. People spontaneously burst into tears. Moms grab their young kids and leave the room. People go over to family members and hug each other. People start praying. One woman lays face down. Other people kneeling. Some people, their hands stretch out to, to this young man. The room went from a roar of the crowd, cheers, chatter, the sound of dribbling balls and squeaky Nikes to deathly quiet except for one noise in the room. A woman screaming at the top of her lungs. If I imitated it, it would offend us all. It's an upsetting scream. She is screaming Jesus and some type of prayer, and then she is praying in tongues. And then she screams Jesus, some kind of prayer, and does it again. As loud as you possibly can imagine, echoing in a gym, you can only hear her and the mumbles of the people administrating CPR and trying to slap the boy awake and administering the defibrillator. It was the boy's mother. Now you have to understand we were in a Baptist church and they were Episcopal. So I don't know how the whole tongue thing works with all them. <laughs> and no one went over there and said, man, man, we're Baptist. We're Baptist church here. Can't do that. It was upsetting to hear. Her. You might even think that's unnecessary. But this was her son. 
This was the baby boy she carried for nine months that she pushed out, that she was the first one to hold, that she nursed at her chest, that she changed his diapers, that she fed his first cereal to, that she, she helped him with his skinned up knee, that watched him dribble a ball for the first time. This is her baby boy about to die, does not have a heartbeat on a stage in front of everyone, and all she has left is to cry out at the top of her lungs, Jesus, and to give everything she's got to pray and ask Jesus to have mercy on on that boy because she was desperate there was no other hope this boy had no heartbeat it's that kind of desperation I'm not saying we have to scream in prayer or be over emotional why did everything happen in that room like that because death had entered the room and death wanted to take someone Friends, I don't think until we have a vision that death has entered the room. The death wants to come to your home, to your marriage, to our city. It is here in our culture. It is on our phones. Until we wake up and realize we are toast. That we've done the, we've done the best. We've, we've made a good try. We got great buildings and great lights, and you can go to other churches, and I mean, they got drummer, they got drummer boys on, on, on you know, little sky ramps. Do, you know, you got people parachuting in church services. You can go and have way better shows than us, and smoke and all that kind. Of, we've we've done a really great job, but death is still in our country. Death is still with people. We have to realize we have no other hope than Jesus showing up, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit for revival in our time, a, a reviving, a restoring of his church and an awakening in our land. The boy was revived and he, he lived and last I heard he was been since released from the hospital. But desperation, it just wants God to move. And we have to come to the place where if, if he doesn't move, I'm dead. If he doesn't continue to work in my heart, then I, I won't be more like Jesus. God, you got to move him. I want to be more like you. I want to be as holy as a man can be as he walks in the earth. And that will only happen if you help me. I want my marriage to not fail and not drift, and not get cold. That will only happen if you help me. I want every one of my children to love you and walk with you and know you and think I have a biblical worldview and give their lives for you and not care about making money and not care about their careers, but they have one burning passion that's to know you and make you known and, and, and just advance the gospel in the world. That's only going to happen if you come and if you pour out your spirit. And we can be content with how things are, and we can keep moaning and groaning that, man, everywhere I look, it looks like there's like mosques, you know, going up everywhere. And, you know, I don't know, church, yeah, I don't know, this next generation, they're just weird. And, man, those people in, you know, office, they're doing that kind of stuff. We can keep doing that if we want. But this kind of stuff, the changing of the air of the world, where now all of a sudden where death was, there was a sense of his presence everywhere. Revival history would tell us that it only comes when God's people pray. We can do things, we have agency, but we are facing things that we cannot solve with intellect and technology, but only with the power of God. So what are kind of some steps? Well, you and I got to pray every day, all the time. You got to have times of prayer. You should probably pray throughout the day. The early church prayed three times a day. Morning, noon, and three, round three. Those are the times of prayer. It's the daily rhythm. The early church prayed the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Some changed it over time where they prayed the Lord's Prayer in the morning. They prayed for the lost at noon, and they reflected on their day and their heart um, at three or in the evening. Different rhythms of prayer. We should turn every community group into a prayer group. Every meeting should be a prayer meeting. We pray first. When the needs arise, we stop and pray. We need some wisdom, stop and pray. 
that person's broken, surround them and pray. And we should gather as a church more and pray. So tonight, at six, is our little humble attempt to do that. Not a show, not a spectacle. Don't come to show off. Don't come to be emotional. Come to pray. Come to commune and contend. And we're going to be persistent every quarter this year. And I tell you, my, my end goal is, is, is even more than that. But I understand small steps. Every quarter this year, we're going to have a night of prayer. And just to, and just to make that, and to make it more frequent than that. And just to keep pushing it. Just gently, and sometimes like this morning, not so gentle. And I know there's a lot of mystery in prayer, a lot we haven't said, a lot we should come back and say, and, and we will come back and say it. But scripture is clear. We've been invited to pray, to ask, to seek, and to knock. You have not because you ask not. The rule of the kingdom is asking. In every move of God in history, revival and awakenings can be traced back to people praying. Because history belongs to the intercessors. And this kind, all the things we're facing in our world today, all the things I'm facing in my heart, they can only be driven out by prayer. It can't be driven out by anything but prayer. So let's pray. So why don't you talk to God about your prayer life? What has God said to you? And what do you need to do about it? Have you lost heart? Are you cynical? Cynicism kills faith. What do you need from him right now? Do you need encouragement? Do you need to repent of prayerlessness? I've had to do that so many times. Do you need to repent of skepticism? Like, will that really change anything? <coughs> Let me pray for you. Our Father in heaven, We just draw near to you now through Jesus and we ask that you just continue to speak to us. Make your spirit known to us. Make us aware of your presence now. Draw us close to you. Come near to us. Speak to us. We want to be, if we're your children, for the followers of Jesus in this room, I know there's something in us. It's called the Holy Spirit that wants to be people that commune with you and contend with you. And I know that well, sometimes that's weird. It feels like there would be more efficient ways for you to do things. But you have sovereignly decreed that you will work through your people praying. Your word says you collect two things, our tears and our prayers. And so we just, we want to be a people that pray. We want to be people that pr always pray and not lose heart. We want to be a people that, the kind of people that when something happens, our first instinct, not our last resort is to say, let's pray. Let's ask for wisdom. Let's ask for mercy. Let's ask for healing. Let's ask for grace. Let's ask for help. I don't know what to do, but Jesus always knows what to do. Let's ask him. Help us be a people that pray first. Help us be a persistent people. And open our eyes to the great need of our heart, the great needs around us, that we might become people that are desperate to realize that we can't be clever enough. We're not going to be slick enough to change what's going on around us. 
we're going to need you to pour out your spirit. We have heard of your fame and your deeds and what you've done and revivals past and scripture and renew them in our day. Why not here, Lord? Why not now? And would you be so kind to start in our hearts now? If that's your prayer, start in my heart, Lord. A renewal, a change. And just tell him that. Maybe even put your palms up in your lap, just a posture of receiving. Not receiving anything from me, receiving from the Lord. And just say, Lord, start in me. Renew me, Lord. Renew my passion for prayer. Renew my faith. I believe. Help my unbelief. Father, make us a people of prayer that draw near to you and keep your word and draw near to us, not so we just feel warm fuzzies, but so the kingdom of heaven breaks in. Let your kingdom come. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Let's respond through the song. Our ushers are going to come. We're going to respond through worshiping, through giving. Then I'll come back up and say a brief word, and then we'll have our prayer team up here after the service to pray for you.